Hey all, and welcome to the finale of Sonic 3D Blast for the Sega Saturn. Just kind of mixed up the order there. We're on the home stretch now. We got all the Chaos Emeralds, and it's time for Gene Gadget. I always found the um, the, the titling of this one a little bit weird. Like, where's the jeans? I see the gadgets, but where are the jeans? Mm. You could say that for a few of these levels. Like the fact that the one after this is called Panic Puppet, I have no fucking clue what they're going for with that one. But like, yeah, this is the point of the game where I feel like the aesthetic is a little bit much for me personally. I find this one a bit loud and a bit ab like abrasive on the eyes, and the fact that this is where it goes into the hardcore techno that we were talking about earlier in this particular soundtrack that. It's like, it's a fine piece of music, but in the context of the game, I think it's a little bit much. Especially coming after, like, the more, like, triumphant RPG sound of Volcano Valley. Yeah. It's suitable for, like, a penultimate level, I guess. Yeah, I can see why they went with this direction. Like, I'm not going to fault it for that. It's just the entire direction of this level is just not to my personal taste, you know? Fair enough. And, like, again, that is the fact that, like, the fact that it's from this isometric perspective, you're seeing a different side of, like, the general Eggman base level. Because it's basically the same trope as something like, say, Scrap Brain, which oh, yeah. is fine, you know? It's just. You get a different outlook on life sometimes. <laughs> oh, you can see Sonic from all around, not just from the side. Just imagine him now, like, Fans was playing this in that position he was in where his back had broken over backwards. That's what. <laughs> oh, wangle and <laughs> dangle on life. <laughs> oh. Spleen. Oh, sorry, it should be pipe. You're spinning through the pipe, I'll let you have that one. Damn, you blitzed that stage, mate. Definitely the first take. Definitely. Of course. Wouldn't expect anything less, Flame. Given we're going between the levels here, this is one thing that, like, just in the interest of being fair, since I did basically just completely glaze the Saturn version in the first part, mm -hmm. I will say the problem that it does inherit is because it's playing from a disc rather than a cartridge, there are a lot of load screens that I had to cut out here, and that's the thing that I think does hurt it compared to the Mega Drive ones, because when I say there's a lot of load screens, I mean in between each level, you have a load screen, so it can load up the map that shows you where you are on, like, on the island, and then after that's gone away, then it loads the level, and it's just kind of a drag. So, yeah, like, I like a lot about the Saturn one, but that is something just to bear in mind if you're picking a version to play. Did this version have the uh, the save game function that the director's version of the Mega Drive one would eventually have? Off the top of my head, I think it does. Like, that was a big change for the Mega Drive one when the Director's Cut version came around, and it's kind of a shame that he didn't have that to start with on the Mega Drive, given that, like, Free and Knuckles did have a save function. And so it was kind of like an established expectation at that point, but you know. That Director's Cut did make a few other changes. Like, that version, it did change the special stage requirements, so for that one it was even harsher than the Saturn one, in that that one made it so you could only get one Chaos Emerald per stage. Ah. So you couldn't, you couldn't just, like, get an easier job on the early levels. Like, no, you did have to still hold on to 50 rings in fucking Gene Gadget here. <laughs> Much easier said than done. Yeah, especially <laughs> since most of the panels here are, like, electrified. Like, on pretty much every screen, there is something that will hurt you. Off we go. We. They got a lot of mileage from that little stinger over the course of the series. <laughs> oh, hell yes. Well, it's one of the most iconic Sonic tracks. Oh, I remember this, boss. Yes, this is one where... You kind of need the perspective to work with you, and sometimes it just doesn't. Um, yeah, good job walking around these spikes. I would jump if I were you. Jumping does make the perspective a bit easier to gauge, because at least then you have the, like, dithering from Sonic Shadows there to kind of tip you off roughly where you are. Yeah. So we got the bullets coming, we got the spike things. I think that's pretty much it, unless he just, like, drops literal Donkey Kong at you at some point. 
<laughs> That's pretty much the gist. He doesn't have his Donkey Kong barrels, which would be kind of funny, but you know, it also wouldn't fit the tech base area. Well, if they made the metal barrels, it'd be fine. Yeah, there was some levels sort of like that in DKC3 from what I recall. It wouldn't be out of place. Yeah, yeah that, that's my favourite of the Donkey Kong Country games, by the way. I like the general atmosphere of 3. I don't know whether I'd say it's my favourite, but I do understand why it would be your favourite, because it's got like a very unique vibe to it compared to 1 and 2. Thank you, Flame. My taste is superior to everyone else's. Now, what do you think about Sonic and the Secret Rings? Uh, it's underrated. Okay, you've just invalidated everything you've said. It also <laughs> needs a complete rehaul from the ground up, because me liking the story, the aesthetics, the music, and just the general vibe is not enough to make it a good game. What it needs is a spiritual successor to Generations where they include some levels from Secret Rings completely redesigned. Thank you. The problem that Secret Rings has is that like, a lot of people will speculate and say that like, the problem is just the motion controls. The problem is not the motion controls, the problem is the fact that the level design had to bend down for the motion controls. And so if you rebind said controls to use a controller, it is literally just hold forward to win. Nah. But now we're in this level here. This one is where it changes up the gameplay loop a little bit because now the flickies are not in enemies. They're in these little capsules that you have to find. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about it in terms of like the world of what's going on, like the story, I'm starting to think that since this is more of a base like area, mm. this is maybe where Eggman's like working on it and he hasn't got around to putting these ones in robots yet. Oh, you mean uh, the, the robots going around are empty and the, they're puppets and there's a panic? You put more thought into this than I ever have. <laughs> <laughs> Sonic is getting to him faster than he expected. He hasn't had time to fill these robots, these badniks, with flickies, hence panic puppet zone. It kind of checks out. I'm not sure if I would use puppet as the word for like a robot, but like, yeah. If they're, they're going for an alliteration thing, so to be fair, their options are kind of limited there, though. Or puppet panic. I don't know. I've got a bush F right now. Leave me alone. I'm going to read this quote from... Who said this? PC Gamer. This is when they were ranking all the Sonic games. Uh -huh. Some journalists have called Sonic 3D Blast one of the worst games in the Sonic franchise. Complex wrote that the game did not feel like a true Sonic game, the latter stating that it was offensive to call it 3D. PC Gamer, here we go, described it as the first sign that Sonic in 3D was just plain not going to work. Which is bullshit, because Sonic Adventure was well received. Yeah. So when people say Sonic had a rough transition into 3D, this is what they mean, right? They're not just giving bad faith takes on Adventure. It couldn't possibly be that, right? Well, they're obviously referring to Adventure and not this. Let's be real. You can tell some journalists' approach, uh, like their experience with Sonic Adventure, is they watch the one Game Grumps clip of Aaron trying to run around the loop-de-loop, -loop, and that's what Sonic Adventure is to them. Ah, see, it is... It's really strange looking at how journalists approach the Sonic series, and still do, to be fair. Like, I think it's arguably better done now than it used to be, because it used to be just be, uh, Sonic's shite, and uh, rough transition to 3D and yada yada yada, and I think we have sort of since, you know, gone past that and got a little bit more of a nuanced set of takes on things. Yeah. But it's, there is still that whole thing of, you can tell when someone has just sort of decided to just throw their voice into the mix for no good reason other than they want their they like the sound of their own voice um, because you end up back in that kind of like early noughties um, 2010s style of uh, journalism when speaking about it it's just like just come on just we've moved on I don't want to paint everyone the same brush here because I, I know there are some people who will just give fair and legitimate criticisms to Sonic games and I don't want to discourage that at all no but I can tell with some journalists and some some outlets that when the new Sonic game comes in, it's an easy day for them. Yes. 
they've just got off of like maybe reviewing an RPG that they had to spend all week playing for their review. Whereas Sonic comes in, they can play it for like an hour, maybe encounter one glitch, and then they can just rehash. Sonic had a rough transition to 3D, and Sonic has never been good, and that's their article. Yeah, for sure. I know it comes off in bad taste to some people to just go in with that cynical view of what they do, but I have seen the some of the absolute worst of the worst in ju games journalism, and there's people in that industry who I would not put that past them. Like, just being blunt. It, it was weird when Sonic Unleashed came out. I, I That game has a, a fair amount of flaws, as much as I love it. But the fact it got such bad reviews just leads me to believe that a lot of that was just animosity lingering from 06. Well, th that's all I can think of, because I remember when it came out, I was just like, how is this game worse than Sonic 06, the famously, incredibly buggy, kind of ugly, hardly finished, cobbled together game versus this actually really incredibly polished, really quite fun title that's got a... I wouldn't say incredibly polished. Relative to 06, but like... Relative to 06, I mean, the vis visually, they are miles apart. To be fair, the Werehog is a massive filter, and I'm not even talking about people who just want something to dunk on. It's like... I mean, that's fair. Some people go in wanting to run fast as Sonic, and they play a day level, and it's Ooh. fun, and then the, like, Werehog comes in, and it's 10 minutes of punching shit. I get that. But also, it's like, the level of criticism seemed, it didn't seem proportional to the problems. Fair enough. Yeah, and we're not going to just suddenly turn around and say this game is underrated, because it's not. It's, it's trying, God bless it, but, you know, it can be very awkward to control, the levels are piss easy, the, the music's stellar, and so are the visuals, but, you know, that's something you can say for a lot of Sonic games. Yeah. It's a game that, like, you can appreciate the soul behind it, but the actual gameplay itself. This game, I'm having much more fun watching this back than I was playing it, and that's kind of where, like, we're in the final boss now, and just to kind of give a sort of cliff notes of where I stand with this, that, that pretty much is where I am. It's like, I like the presentation, it's got a certain charm to it, but actually playing it, it doesn't really hold up for me. Yeah, if you're going to play a version of the game, I would say seek out the, uh, director's cut of the Mega Drive one. That is my favorite way to play the game because, you know, you've got a save function, you've got Supersonic, you've got other, like, you know, nips and tucks that the game's uh, original director put in. I, I think it was the original director. It was, yeah, I think it was John the, Burton. Yeah, the main programmer. And uh, this arena is so much different to the Mega Drive one because here it's, like, well lit. You've got a sparkly platform. You're very clearly in the depths of Panic Puppet Zone or whatever factory Robotnik was building the Badniks in. And in that one, it's all dark and foreboding and it's like some kind of fancy land. I'm sorry to interrupt here, but I absolutely love this particular cycle of the boss. This is what you do to not get hit. You stand here. But yeah, the difference between this version and the Mega Drive one is the Mega Drive one was just a solid background, whereas this one actually has a background. You can actually see the factory. Uh Bless it, the Mega Drive was trying, but, you know, it was that day at that point. Mm -hmm. Basically, the way this boss works is that there's just two rounds where we go through the same phases again. So, I've basically gave my summary here, but, like, Tom, what's your take on Sonic 3D Flicky's Island, mate? It's like you said, it has a lot of soul, but unfortunately we play games to play them, and isometric at least at the time, was not fully perfected for, uh, you know, the 3D platformer. You know, I feel like it came better with GBA titles and so on. So, I would say this is probably somewhere between a 5 and a 7. I would maybe settle on a 6. I could see that. Like, it's the sort of thing where now we can look back at it as, like, an interesting experiment. Yes. Back in the day, if you paid full price for this, you probably would have been disappointed. That's... It's one of those kind of deals. I, I would agree on that. I think, kind of, having sort of my vague memories of this and sort of watching it all through now, I think I would probably say it's very much a 5 out of 10 title. Like, adequate, like, just okay, but not anything, like, not horrific, not, like, actively terrible, but not exactly 
what I would call good either. No. Yeah, it's a better idea than it is a game, and that's kind of where we've landed on this one. Indeed so, mate. Alright, last, uh, last go around, let's do this. No talk, be angry. I'm just gonna sit in the corner and sulk if that's okay. <laughs> you do that. Yeah, we, do, we just spend, like, ages just shitting on this game that he's worked so hard to be part of. Like, of course he's going to go sulk in a corner. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sonic. You, you know, you have a lot of games. Not all of them are going to be 10 out of 10, mate. This was an outsource game. Sonic didn't care. Sonic got paid either way. Oh, 3D ending cutscene. Oh, in the Mega Drive one, it was still images. It was slightly creepy still in images. There was a bit of an uncanny valley going on with those. So. Uh, I guess there was. I guess there was flame. But uh, we're done here. So uh, I'm going to wrap things up. And I'll say we shall see you next time for Sonic Pocket Adventure. I've been Antob64. I've been the Flameclaw. And I've been Richie. And we'll see you next time for another HSC playthrough. Bye-bye.